Good evening, everybody. It's about 6.30 and I think we've still got some people coming in, but we will get started in the interests of time. So welcome everyone to this webinar on mental health and well-being and an introduction to our mental health toolkit. My name is Emma Gibbons and I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Volleyball BC and I am privileged to be speaking to you from North Vancouver, which is in, on the traditional and unceded territories of the Squamish, the Tsleil-Waututh and the Mus Musqueam First Nations. But volleyball, is, as you know, is played across this province and we're very grateful for that opportunity. I'm really, really excited to be here today because this is the culmination of a lot of work and hard and effort on our part, but also on the part of our community to come forward with the their needs and to talk to us about how important mental health and well-being is in volleyball. And so I'm excited to get going and to introduce you to what we've been working on. So without further ado, I'd like to pass it over to Dr. Shauna Taylor, who will introduce herself, um, but has been a very close colleague working in this space with us. And we've been very, very lucky to work with her. So I'd like to pass it over to Shauna. Actually, before I do so, a couple of very quick, short um, housekeeping notes, just to let you know that we are recording this session. But also, if anyone has any questions at any time, please do feel free to put them in the chat and I'll be monitoring those and we'll have a chance to answer those when we get to the end of the webinar. Anyway, over to you, Shauna. Thank you so much, Emma. It has been an absolute thrill to work with you and Volleyball BC and with all of the amazing information gathering that you're going to be talking about in a few minutes. Um, all the outreach that you did throughout the volleyball community that has been so forward thinking and progressive and really opened their arms widely um, for finding out more about this space of mental health and well-being it was a logical place of one of the leading sports in the province to want to really get going on this really important work. So I'm a, as it says on the slide, I'm a professor at UBC Vancouver. I work in a master's program that specializes actually in coaching and leadership and sports psychology, of course, is really close to my heart. I was the past chair of our national association and I'm actually coming to you uh, because we're doing this virtually. I'm coming to you from the traditional unceded territory of the Silex Nation, which is in the interior of the province in the Okanagan. So what we're going to do tonight before I hand it back to Emma is we're going to let you in a little bit on all of the groundwork that set the stage for this project to take flight in the first place. So all the history and outreach, and Emma's going to really start with that, all the hard work that they've been doing for years behind the scenes. And based on that, and the broader field of mental health and well-being, what we felt were the most important toolkit elements that clubs, programs, special teams, families, special populations like officials and coaches might need in this area. And this is an opportunity to really give some instructions, give a snapshot of what they look like so that you can then go on the website and navigate that and take a look and see where you'd like to start. We're hoping it'll be a lot clearer after tonight's webinar so you'll know exactly what's on there, but also where you might want to begin depending on what your needs are. And then we're just going to you know, go down action items and what should be your first step and all the things to come. So I'm going to now hand things off. To Emma again. Thanks, Shauna. So the starting point for us was really around the development of our strategic plan, which happened around uh, 2020, actually, just before the pandemic hit. And we did a lot of talking to the community and the volleyball community and finding out what priorities were for our players, for our coaches and for our referees. And a big piece that came out of that was about um, safety in sport, and that being a broad concept, which might include injury or concussion and abuse and maltreatment, but also included mental health and well-being. So the feedback that we heard loud and clear was that this was a priority for our sport, that our culture has generally been very positive, but there are areas of work, as there is across many sports, and that we really needed to provide more resources and support in the areas of safe sport. So as a direct result of that, we formed the Safe Sport Working Group, who has been now in place for probably the last couple of years. And they really helped us shape our Safe Sport Action Plan, 
which was our commitments in those four different areas in physical injury, concussion, abuse and maltreatment and mental health. And that action plan has been well underway now. I think we were in year two of looking at how we can really move forward in those four areas. And so this toolkit came out of the section on mental health and was one of the priorities that we had identified in that action plan. So moving on to the next one, this so this slide, what I wanted to share with everyone was some of the research and the consultation that we undertook, because as Shauna said, we didn't really just man manifest this out of thin air. It really came out of the work and the voices and the conversations that we had in many different areas as we were developing our priorities around safety. So this is some of the areas that we undertook to do that consultation. We've done annual member surveys now for the last three years, and we consistently ask the same questions about mental health and well-being. And in particular, we ask about what factors are impacting people's performance. Like, what are some of the um, issues that you faced during the last volleyball season? What are some of the factors that are impacting your well-being and your ability to participate in volleyball and we offer a whole host of different options and we've consistently seen that some of the top results are around mental uh, exhaustion feeling overloaded performance anxiety and I'll get into that a little bit later but that was those surveys have really got good traction now because we've been doing them for three years and we've started to be able to see that there are consistent trends some of the other things we did was we, we did some focus groups with Shauna, actually, and the Team BC athletes. That was back in 2021, where we did some table discussions with our 18 new athletes. So those who had been through the volleyball system and who are now participating at a high performance level. And we just had some very open discussion about the areas that they wished that they had had resources or what their experiences had been like coming up through the volleyball system and different ways or thoughts or ideas that they had about how we might better support athletes that were coming through. So that was really helpful because it allowed us to really just chat with some of the youth um, participants, which, which we don't always connect with as well during, through the survey results. Which leads me to my next one. We then decided that we wanted to do a really focused youth mental health survey because we had heard so broadly that people or youth wanted extra resources in the field of mental health but that can be a really broad concept and we weren't really sure what that meant was it about mental performance was it about depression was it about body image we we really couldn't tell so the survey we undertook in 2022 was very much focused at reaching our youth participants and trying to identify a little bit more clearly what areas of mental health were important to them and then ask them a bit more specifically about what kind of resources or what kind of support might be helpful and then for the last, finally, for the last two provincial championships, we've had more interactive ways to hear from our participants. So this year, for example, you can see that picture. We had some really like fun boards where we asked key questions about how we can support mental health and well-being, what resources people might want, how we could better support people who were struggling. And we encouraged all the participants there from age 13 to 18 to complete the stickies to put up their thoughts and their ideas and at the end of those three weekends we were able to collate them and have a look at some of the themes that came out from them and it was just a very useful insight into everybody's experience. We also did do a big program push on Buddy Check for Jesse um, which is about a, a mental health program which encourages youth um, to check in with their peers as, as to their mental health and well-being. So here on this very busy slide are some of the things that we heard from all of that the consultation work. So from 2021 to 2023, the top negative factors impacting performance in volleyball or impacting people's experiences was fear of failure and general life stress. So as I said, we gave out different options for people to respond and those consistently have been the top. And that doesn't matter whether you're an athlete, a player, a coach, a referee, you're male, you're female, we've done the analysis. Those two are 
the top factors that were identified as, as the negative factors impacting experience. There were some differences on the gender front, and so concerns about body appearance and also team dynamics or team culture was something that was also rated very highly by females in our system. And then mental exhaustion and physical fatigue were the top two factors that were listed as being experienced during the volleyball season. So we also asked like, what kind of feelings are you feeling during the volleyball season? What, um, again, what impacts your well-being? And mental exhaustion and physical fatigue have by far been the top two answers to that question. And again, that doesn't really matter about what role people play in the volleyball system. It's just consistently listed as those two. We also asked coaches and referees where they felt that they needed help and resources. Um, and that was specific to looking at all areas of safety. So we asked them about concussion and injury and abuse and mental health. And mental health, again, was by far the area where coaches and referees said, we don't actually know very much about it. We don't have the resources. We don't really feel like we're equipped to be able to handle issues if they arise. And then equally, when we spoke to the athletes in the focus groups, the female athletes in particular also said, well, we'd like more information about mental health and well-being. It was where they felt that our system or our processes just weren't meeting their needs enough as well. And then finally, the feedback we got from that work at the provincial championships was um, that the top three challenges that athletes said they had experienced in the season leading up to the provincial championships were performance anxiety, and that was above and beyond the first item. But then that was followed by team relationships or interpersonal relationships within the team environment, and then also technical skills, which was a which was a third in there. And on top of that, they also said that they would love extra support and resources and information specifically in three areas, and that was performance anxiety, self-care, and team dynamics and relationships. So we took all of that work and that was sort of the foundation for us establishing a working relationship with Shauna and looking at, well, how do we start to address some of these areas? And we recognize that some of these are, are quite specific and we have offered webinars in the field of um, performance anxiety. And as you'll learn later on, we're going to be offering other webinars over the season in some of other areas as well that are related to mental wealth, well-being. Um, but we also felt that we needed to create a tool or create resources that started to address the system a little bit more and that were targeted on the clubs, that were targeted on the groups, like Shauna said, of referee committees or other sort of structural pieces within our sport so that we, we can really start trying to shift the culture and embed athlete well-being and athlete focus at the center of that and hopefully in doing that we can start to address some of these issues that we're hearing from such as the mental exhaustion and the um, performance anxiety and feeling pressure and we can start to change that experience a little bit and that will translate to a change on an individual level as well. So that's my very brief summary of where we've been and so I'm going to hand it back to Shauna to talk about where where we're going from here. Thanks, Emma. Well, it's a ton of amazing work and it was an excellent problem to have. I wouldn't call it a problem, really. It was honestly fantastic to have that foundation. So we weren't starting from nowhere. We were starting from really some very known quantities and issues that the community was saying loud and clear they really would like to address and they'd like to know more about. And so if we're thinking about mental health in a sport context, part of the reason that I think the sports sector at large has been so slow compared to some other sectors and uh, even resistant to understanding more about broader mental health issues is the stoic nature of sport. And I say stoic because in sport, it really is all about, I mean, it's called competitive sport, right? So that can be a wonderful gift to give our children and to, to play all the way through our, our, our lifetime, having this opportunity to test ourselves and build positive relationships. But it also means there is a ton of embedded stoicism in there. Stoicism on behalf of the, um, the athletes, the coaches, the officials, 
the leaders. It's part of broader sport culture. And, and with that stoic or kind of stiff upper lip, carry on um, attitude, it also means that we've got some other messaging like building mental toughness, which in itself is not such a bad thing. We want to build toughness and resiliency, but it sends a really powerful and sometimes stigmatizing message is that you, if you're not mentally tough, it must mean that you're mentally weak. So what we wanted to do by the creation of this toolkit and these resources and opportunities for clubs and cultures to change and learn, it's like a global view and reset of this idea of toughness. Instead, what if we called it mental flexibility instead? What if it wasn't meaning we're excluding toughness, but we instead want more emotional agility. We want mental flexibility. We want the ability to ebb and flow as competition gets higher and higher and pressures mount and pressures go down and dynamics change that we're flexible. And that is a really important overarching uh, commentary that I thought it was worth mentioning right off the bat so that we could start talking about some of these important cultural changes. This over overarching, I suppose, framework has four key components, and it starts with a dashboard that you can see. It's a it's a working document that is flexible, and it's something that whether you're a club president or a coach or a parent or you're in some kind of leadership role in a special team, you can go on and use that dashboard tool, and it basically will walk you through all of the elements. So you make sure that you're not missing anything, and it gives you some instructions of where you might want to start by doing a little bit of an audit of where your club is at or your program is at, okay? So the, the dashboard is an overarching tool to help you keep track of your progress if you, as you try to integrate some of this material. The second part is six pillars of very practical information. Some of them are templates, some of them are checklists, some of them are information messaging that you can use that's accurate, that's recent, so that you can feel free to add that to social media posts, for example, use it in a communication tool, use it in a club um, newsletter or something to that effect. So the six pillars we'll get into tonight, and hopefully by the time we're done, you're going to have a better idea of just what exactly those pillars are made up of. There will also be some navigation tools that will be part of the sixth pillar, actually, which is building a resource network. And those navigation tools are really important. I'm going to go through some of the most, I think, critical ones and the ones that will be the most pragmatic or practical that you could use on an annual basis that you can update on an annual basis the same way that you, when you get your first aid kit that's in your car or what you take with you um, from competition to competition, you want to make sure it's fully stocked. Everything's updated in there. Nothing's expired. You, you know where you are. You know where the nearest hospital is. Well, same thing when it comes to mental health care. So building that toolkit for yourself and getting a little more educated on what that network could look like. That's the navigation tools. And then we're excited to talk about everything that you see tonight isn't really the end of it. It's just the beginning. There are other webinars that are going to be interactive. We're going to have some guests uh, coming. We're going to talk about our ambassadors in a few minutes who will be voices from the field, actual players and members of the volleyball community that feel strongly about the importance of mental health literacy and information. And we're hoping that they'll be joining us. I know we've got one tonight who's going to be joining us and I'll reveal who that is in a few moments. You can always look on the guest list of who's logged in. You might recognize her, but um the education webinars, those will be sort of sprinkled throughout the year at times where we feel that, or rather Emma and Volleyball BC feel is going to be the most beneficial. So that's what it's going to look like tonight. And we're going to start off by going down each of the pillars. We've already talked about the dashboard. It kind of is what it is. Um, it's a it's a checklist. It helps you navigate things. And so you can download that and, and let that be your roadmap as you work your way through these tools but we're gonna go down through the six different pillars, beginning with awareness and ambassadors. So I won't read the slide here. We're just gonna move through the six and we're gonna start out with the first one. This continuum here is probably the very first step that you're gonna to wanna to do. So regardless of what you're coming at this as, whether you're uh, part of a club, 
you're part of a special team or program, maybe you're a coach, maybe you're a sport parent, you're a technical leader, taking a look at what is the mental health awareness in my club or program. And it might not just be you that can answer that question. You might have to do some outreach. You might have to bring a group together, get a little bit of a, consolidate some ideas and figure out exactly where you are. Is it really minimal awareness? Are we kind of in the high awareness zone? Or is this something we've already been doing for some time? We're sort of one of those shining star clubs where this was something we adopted early on. We're actually a bit ahead of the curve and that may very well be. In some sports, we do see some real champions and leaders that got way out front, and that's fantastic. But just knowing where you are is a good place to begin. And based on that, you can decide, well, how elementary do we need to go with our messaging? Do we need to go right back to basics and start with a communication um, blitz? Or do we want, or we sort of further, further along the pathway? So that would be one of the first steps. The second one in this first pillar of communication and, and awareness and ambassadors is this idea that you wanna enhance awareness by perhaps bringing in a set of individuals that have leadership qualities, but also a real interest, lived experience, and maybe even some uh, training in, in mental health. So you can see on here, the ambassador team should be representative of you and who you are make it as diverse as possible. And it doesn't have to be huge. It could be two or three people, or it could be very tactical and maybe a little bit bigger, depending on your capacity. Could be made up of athletes, coaches, officials, all kinds of volunteers, maybe a member from your board, whatever that looks like. And just something to consider. And one of the tools that you'll see is the way that you can assemble this mental health ambassador team. For Volleyball BC, they already have done that heavy lifting and leg work, and they have an athlete team assembled of these three amazing individuals. And we have Shanice Marcel on the call tonight. So thank you so much for joining us. And Kyla Ritchie and uh, Derek Thiessen, who are not with us tonight, but we're hoping to engage them in some really meaningful ways in some of the materials and workshops in the future so that we can bring their voices in because we know that one way that we get a lot of traction as human beings is through modeling theory. And modeling theory is just like it sounds. You look to someone who is modeling behavior, talking about messages that are positive, that we want to affect positive change. And especially in youth, they're very impressionable and much more open to adopting new ideas if they have ambassadors that are bringing that messaging to them. So some of the tools and templates that are in this particular pillar key messages and a communication tool. So you don't have to come up with all the, the messages. We actually have some really powerful ones to dispel myths, to get rid of some of that stigma about talking about mental health, some different activities that you might wanna undertake to build more awareness in your club. Some of them are really fun and actually could create some great team building opportunities as well. And then of course, this idea of having some strong voices and some visibility from the field. Um, in the in the way of having ambassadors an ambassador team so that's what the first pillar is like I don't know Emma if you have anything to add there on the pillars idea no I think that's a that's a great summary as it as Shauna said the tools and templates are designed to be very um, hands-on and so that you can work your way through it and tailor it to your unique um situation or what you feel is best appropriate for your program so it can feel like there's a lot of information there but I think it's really about picking out what re resonates and what's within your capacity to deliver exactly and that's the thing I mean it's a it's a list but it isn't the kind of thing where you have to check off everything you're going to be able to go through it and decide what might be the right right fit for your population where you are what you have the capacity to complete and please don't hesitate as well if you need to reach out and need more information. We're trying to give as much background information as we can, but we certainly would love to get some feedback as well from all of the amazing Volleyball BC membership. The second pil pillar is this idea of culture change and that we can talk about a global reset of culture change in sport. I mentioned the stoic nature earlier and some of the stigma that is associated with talking about our mental health 
But this idea that supporting someone and focusing on their well being, that it's somehow disconnected from performance, when in fact, it is inextricably and very importantly linked between the two. So the performance cycle, well being, support, and mental health all go in a, a very symbiotic and interrelated cycle. And you have this balance that I think a lot of programs, especially as you go higher up into higher and higher competition and levels of high performance, we have this idea of we're striving for excellence, we're wanting to build resiliency, we're wanting, of course, performance to get to go up with as we learn skills and as we become better and more proficient. But it doesn't mean that we can't then provide support for people who might be struggling, especially in the area of mental health, that we want to encourage them as part of that balance with performance. We want them to encourage help seeking, right? We want to encourage balance in their life and in well-being. And if we do that balance, in fact, what we end up seeing, a lot of the research says, is we see a we see a rise in performance. It isn't like you have to choose one over the other. So this pillar is all about how does this cycle actually work? And so this particular slide talks about striking that balance and how that excellence and support is a cycle. So you've got, and there's no beginning or ending here, right? So you're providing quality support. Someone might be able to then recover from whatever it is they are struggling with, more performance takes place, but then we might once again have another dip and we might have another mental health concern or some other form of life issue where they might need to seek help. And if they're in the quality supportive environment, they will do so, they will recover and they will return to performance. And so it goes and it goes and goes and goes. Instead of having someone fall off this wheel, which means they get out of here and they leave the sport or they honestly stay stuck in the struggle zone, which is not a place that we want any of our participants to be, whether it is athletes, coaches, officials, volunteers, or leaders, everybody deserves help. Everybody deserves to have the culture of support. So that's what the second, the second uh, pillar is all about. And what you'll receive in this one is tools and templates that will give you some ideas and strategies as a club on how you can prioritize that in your club. What does that look like? Maybe you need to take a look at some of your policies that would then prioritize ethical decision-making, the, the safe uh, sport group and working groups and inclusion committees all had a voice and had a chance to vet some of these materials as well. So we hope that these two important tools will be useful for your club or program. So that's the second pillar. The third one then is how we communicate about mental health. And I would argue it's bigger than that, because if you're following the kind of really pro-social, empathetic communication that we're recommending and that we're hoping to expose more people to, I think it's going to solve a lot of issues. It isn't just going to create better mental health and performance outcomes. It actually creates a warmer environment as that sense of caring. And I think a lot of deep understanding. So what this particular pillar provides is two different perspectives on how we go about discussing mental health. And we give some examples and we give some templates so that you can even practice doing role play. At the end, there's an action list so that you can, coaches can introduce this type, this style of communication to their athletes. Coaches could do it amongst themselves. I would recommend board members. In fact, we talk about every member of the sport community can really benefit from this. An empathetic communication style is one that they're talking about in the business community now. We're talking about it in education. We're talking about it in law enforcement, everywhere. Having empathy, being a human, truly knowing how to connect and build quality relationships and make someone feel safe. How is that ever a bad idea, right? We think it's just, it's good business, but it also is going to promote uh, better mental health. The second half of that or a really important component of empathetic communication is how you listen. And so in sport, we tend to be extremely practical. We give a lot of direction. We don't necessarily have the best listening skills. <laughs> Part of that is because of the fast paced dynamics that we see in a lot of our, especially team sports. But if we can do just a few tweaks, when we get into those interpersonal one-on-one -on -one or group discussions, 
and we really learn how to listen deeply and actively, you'd be surprised what you actually hear. You stop listening just to hear, you start listening to understand. And then that's how we build culture change. So communication has to be a really important pillar. And we feel so strongly that this is actually part of the learning curve. And that's why the tools and templates have been provided in communication style. The fourth one is connection. And I know Emma talked about all of the fantastic outreach that they did across the province with the membership in a variety of ways. But I know from over 20 years of working in sport, connecting people is probably the number one reason. It's not just demonstrating that that we're better than somebody else. It's not just the travel. It's not just the cool uniforms. It's not just the fitness. It is the human connection. And so volleyball is one of the most ultimate team sports. It's one of those sports where everyone is physically and emotionally engaged together. And that's what makes it so great. So we know that when we ask people why they play, so many of them, it's for the relationships and social connections. It's why it's such a popular um, summer sport on the beach. It's why it's so popular in senior leagues and master's leagues, because it's a game you can play for years and years. So that idea of coming together and connecting is so key. And in this one, we thought about providing some direction and ideas in a few key places. One is just how sport itself connects. So on more of a multi-sport view, um, vital signs, this, this important study was done across Canada, and it was done through the Canadian Centre for Ethics in Sport and the Community Foundation of Canada. And they give some really great ideas on how clubs and programs can really knit together that beautiful tapestry of a very connecting experience for a sport club like volleyball. The other one is looking at one special population. So just an example, we, there are so many out there, it was hard to know what to include. But these ones, because they're Canadian and they have very practical applications, we thought these would probably be the most practical, pragmatic ones if your board or your leadership is interested um, by the Canadian Women in Sport. And it's called She Belongs. And they have a ton of really great ideas about retaining girls, especially during those key dropout years. But we know that in volleyball, it's equally important to engage and keep the boys because the membership for both all gen across the gender spectrum is important. We want to think about retention. And that actually leads me to the fifth pillar, which is if we're thinking about intent, uh, retention, we're thinking about inclusion, we need to talk about the broader and um, field of inclusion and things like gender equity and diversity. This probably could be a strategy all its own because it is just, it is so huge, but it is daunting. It's daunting, but it is so important. And we know that this is something that sport is really alive to now and is working very hard um, to get better at. And we actually have provided a tool that is specific, an inventory that is specific to this particular pillar. So you'll get this um diversity, equity, and inclusion audit tool. So you can take a look at it. And some of the ideas, particularly based on your specifics of where you are and what you might need in the area of inclusion. And you can take a look at different actions on the far left. And it gives you some examples and you'll see some ideas in the template asking you questions. Do you have this? Have you thought about including this? Have you thought about what your environment is like, how open and accessible it is to say someone who arrives in a large urban center, but has language challenges, for example. What's the transportation situation like for the club? Is there anything that we could do to make the transportation a little easier? What about things like affordability? What about how much we connect with the community around us? How do we encourage things like equity and diversity in our programs? And what about safety? and inclusion. So you don't have to think of all the brainstorm idea. We did that for you. You need to just simply decide now, take a look and maybe get a targeted group or someone who can lead the charge of deciding which are some of these things that, that look really important to us and where do we want to start. And so this tool will help you do that. So we've got that audit tool. And then there are a wide variety of trainings Coaches might get interested in taking training. I know a lot of boards of directors feel very strongly about 
their responsibility and their their role as sport leaders. And so this is a really great idea once a year to take an idea of what's important to us in our our principles and the reasons why we we exist and what are we going to have our leadership make a commitment to in order to get a bit more informed. And so this is uh, a listing of all kinds of Canadian based um training that you can create take in order to create a more welcoming club or program. Anything to add there, Emma? I know it's a big one. You've done a lot of work by, you already have, you have a subcommittee. on. We do, yeah. We actually had the subcommittee look at that tool and have, and they were really, they really enjoyed looking at it and felt that it was very practical. It is a big area. I mean, there's so many different elements around diversity and inclusion, but what we've really tried to focus on is what are those practical steps that a club or a program or a group of individuals could take to make a more welcoming space for people. So as you said, Shauna, it's a question of looking at it and picking out what's relevant and what's achievable. Because we, you know, we're well aware that everybody has limited time and resources and lots of people are volunteer, obviously, but it, it there are some steps there that maybe it's just thinking about how, what you're delivering and doing it in a slightly different way. And I exactly. think that that's what we focused on trying to make it super practical. Precisely. So hopefully, um... People look at it with the open open mind and open eyes of, of not having to do all of it. Rome wasn't built in one day. It's about taking a few key ideas and gaining a little bit of momentum by focusing on one or two key things in, the, in an area that's of importance to you and your program. And so the last pillar is building a network. And that network has two parts. It has both an internal mental health asset component and an external mental health asset. What are mental health assets? They're essentially anything that we have that's going to help us maintain positive mental health outcomes in our well-being. So if it's internal, that's something like your personal coping skills or the way you take care of yourself, some of those self-regulation skills, for example, things that we need to we do usually need to be taught these or we have to have them nurtured in some way. So we have a whole inventory of tools. We'll have workshops coming down the pipe. We have a couple workshops that have already been delivered and those have been recorded and those will be made available. I don't know if they're made available already. Are they on there, Emma? They are on there the already. One, the performance anxiety one is already listed on our webpage as a um, webinar that we held just before provincials last year. And I think we opened up registration and had about 400 people sign up within two days. The response was really incredible. Um, so we recorded that one and it is available on the webpage where this mental health toolkit is. Um, the second one that we've also just delivered is a referee specific one on um, dealing with stressful situations. And that one is still being processed as a recording, but we'll be putting it on the website as soon as we can. And that's fantastic because then anyone can do that on their own time. If you only have half, it's an hour long, you only have half an hour, you can do it in, in bits and pieces as well. And that way you can have the athlete in your household take a look, but also maybe there's a coach in your household or maybe you're uh, a parent who wants to be supportive. We're trying to take these, um, take the feedback and create very practical. So they've got tools in them. They've got strategies and approaches, but also a little bit of Q&A as well. So hopefully you'll have a chance to go back and take a look at those if you miss them when they happen live. And so the internal and external are a variety of different tools and ways to manage better self-care, ways to navigate the mental health system, and some templates, like I mentioned earlier, we always, every year we want to make sure that we don't have expired ointment and things like that in our um, in our health kit that we have in our car or those that are doing all of your first aid. Well, we want to have the same update when it comes to if we strike a, a, a tough scenario on our team where we we have someone who's in need of some extra support, who do we go to? So this is where we can create that network and it's got some ideas for you to find out who in the community and where you want to go. This is an example of a tool. I also worked with and gained permissions from the Canadian Olympic Committee as they have a variety of great information that we use. I'm, I'm a service provider at it. It's called the Canadian Centre for Mental Health and Sport. I'm a therapist there. And so this is one of the tools that I use when I'm explaining to an athlete what we also work with coaches 
what some of those mental health indicators are. So it's a bit of like a stoplight type tool so that we can take a look at some healthy and reactive be reacting behavior that are quite typical. And we would go through that in the green and the yellow zone throughout the course of anybody's average day. But when we get into the injured category or we get into the red zone or the illness category, it gives some signs and symptoms and where we might want to start looking for some additional support and maybe even some external expert support. So those are some of the tools. This is another tool is one for coaches, parents, leaders to do a check-in. So not just teaching athletes to check in, I would challenge that leaders need to be doing this too, because we all need to be managing our mental health. It's just taking a little bit of a temperature check on how am I doing? Do I need a bit of a break before I step in that gym? Do I need to go and do a walk around the block? Do I need to do something to relieve some stress? Do I actually need to take some kind of, maybe it's a course or something for me myself to get more educated in a certain area. And so the check-in tools can be very valuable in empowering people to take charge of their mental health awareness and to get a little bit more skilled at some of those, those coping skills, for example. The other thing I just alluded to a few minutes ago was this idea of, of an external network. So there are also tools in the kit that will help you look for global mental health warning signs. Also crisis lines, so things in a pinch, everyone would be able to write, recite to you, um, or maybe not, since we all have phones, nobody commits anything to memory anymore. It's all on speed dial. I don't know anybody's phone number, to be honest with you. It's all just on my phone. So this instead is the type of thing that you could keep in your first aid kit if you have a team binder or something that your trainer takes or that your coach has. This could be a, an external asset that you have with you where you've done a little bit of legwork. Maybe you can assign this to a member of your leadership team or a parent volunteer. Maybe you've got somebody that works in the mental health domain and you can write down some of the contact information and more um, sort of next step contacts and experts in the area that can work with you and your team if you should ever need them. This way, that's done at the beginning of the season or whenever you have, of course, the opportunity to do it. And you would up the, update that each year to make sure that these folks are still in practice or they're still in your community and they're a resource for you. So that's another tool. Other thing that we have is we have some two page information sheets. So some of them are also specific to things like signs and symptoms, effects on performance and next steps for help. So here are some of the subjects, and these might even be things that we will add to as time goes by, but for the time being, these were five of the issues that are the most prevalent in terms of mental health concerns amongst athletes, but also coaches and leaders. So that is anxiety and things like um, all associated disorders and issues relating to anxiety, depression, and I would add in there other, other mood disorders substance misuse or substance use disorder, body image and eating uh, disorders and disordered eating management, and burnout. So these are the five that we chose to focus on. They have the one side where you might have an introduction into some of the background, some of the effects, some of the signs and symptoms, and then a case illustration on the back, as well as how and where to seek help in case you suspect that someone you care about might be suffering here. What do I do next? And so you don't need to be a mental health expert in order to be a caring citizen. You don't have to suddenly become an expert in any of these things, but we need to be more aware. Same as we don't expect coaches, we don't expect, expect sport parents to be orthopedic specialists. We don't expect you to have you know, a medical degree, right? but we expect you to be able to spot some of those common signs and symptoms of a physical illness or injury. Same thing when we're looking at mental health. We also have ideas around if it's an emergency and if it's a non-emergency and how do we even know if it's the difference between the two. And that's a very important um, distinction to draw as well. So we have information to help you triage your way through an emergency situation, a non-emergency situation, and also the follow-up afterwards. Once you've 
use that tool and taking care of the scenario, what can we learn from that? What can we do better? And importantly, what could we do to maybe prevent some of that from happening the next time, if possible, right? I was just going to add, Shauna, that I actually think those are some of the most impactful and useful for programs and for organizations. I mean, certainly even for ourselves, you know, we have had scenarios turn up with participants of all different roles where we've had situations arise and we just haven't really known exactly how to handle it. Whereas, you know, as you say, on the physical front, we kind of know the 911 and we know the, okay, this is the, these are the steps we're a little bit more familiar with. And I would say concussion protocols are also very well established generally in sport. Yet, you know, when it comes to mental health emergencies or non-emergencies or issues, just even knowing what to do and and how to move that person to a place of safety or make sure that they get the support that they need. So that those, I think those four handouts that you just talked through will be really helpful for clubs and for organizations and for parents and groups to just understand like, what is our role and what should we do in that situation? The other really good one that you, you've added in is about consent as well. And again, you know, that can be a bit tricky and what, what can you disclose to parents or not disclose to parents and when can a, athlete make decisions that are informed so I think those are really practical elements that people will find very very helpful thank you yeah that I I know that that is a really big concern for everyone is wanting to know how to approach them with sensitivity and compassion but also making sure that we don't miss signs right and nobody wants to feel like they were they were uninformed, but the reality is this is a big area and we've got to start somewhere and the same way that we all get educated on physical training as well. So hopefully they will, they will be as practical as we tried to make them. And you'll see that we've included everything from at the club and local level, what might be a resource that you'd want to use all the way through to high performance. If you have athletes that are in your family or in your area that are playing on regional high performance centers, varsity national teams we've got different resources across the spectrum so all of them are covered and i see actually there's something i don't know if we should address the q a right now but i do see that um there's should we want to do q a at the end do you think emma let's do it at the end but yeah, yeah i love the great really question and some I, questions yeah, and i, think I wanna I agree, yeah yeah i'd also encourage other people to put questions in and we'll we'll have a chance once we wrap this up to, to go through them okay that's gr- that's awesome. So we're getting there. We're almost there. <laughs> so um, so then in addition to the pillars and to some of the network tools that we've just alluded to, we also have some education webinars and workshops that are geared towards all, all the whole system at large. So there will be language in there that's athlete specific. And then of course, in the language of a coach who's wanting to deliver that skill to the athlete. And that's in the area of performance anxiety, which we already talked about, officiating stress, which we already talked about, team dynamics. So positive pro-social dynamics. We know that things like harassment, bullying, very negative dynamics are part of any human group has the potential to bridge off and break off and devolve into something antisocial. So team dynamics, the more that we can manage them and address them and try to build that strong foundation from the get-go, the better. So that's what that workshop will focus on. Self-care, athletes asked for this, right? Leaders, at these, these are the things they wanted. They really wanted this. They said this loud and clear. So this will include some of the resources that are in this toolkit, but a few extras as well. So things to that they can take control of, that they can feel more empowered and feel like they have agency to take a little bit more care of, of themselves. And that almost always will lead to better uh, mental health outcomes when someone feels autonomous and empowered. And then the last one is the delicate but precious relationship that we have with our body. So in sport, it is about what you can do. But it's also about what you look like. And there are a tremendous amount of societal pressures on all of us, regardless of where we are on the gender spectrum, regardless of whether we play beach or court or we're recreational or we're very high comp- level of competitiveness. That pressure that we feel and the relationship with our body and performance and things like self-esteem are very sensitive and calibrated um, in a really unique way in sport. So that 
webinar, we'll talk all about energy budgets and hopefully developing environments where we have a very positive um, pro positivity body, uh, or even at the, at a minimum body neutrality in our programs where we're really focusing on the person, what they can do, who they are and what their contribution is not so much what they look like. So that's some of the targeted webinars and Emma is going to, with her team, will be deciding on when those are going to be rolled out. So we haven't really decided yet. Have we, Emma? I don't think. No, I think we're going to look at the timing around the season and see what makes most sense and, and figure where we'll get like the most attract, uh, traction in there. But we will be recording all of them so that we have them as a as a resource on the website as well. I see we've got yeah. into questions, which is great, and we can turn that over. But I did also just want to say, in terms of next steps on this, that we will be sharing the um, the toolkit more widely and continuing to share it out with our clubs. And we're really going to be encouraging people to take it up and to try out different elements and also to get feedback, because this was like a, a, a project that took on a lot of input, but equally we know that when people start using it, things come up or maybe some things are helpful and others are not, or maybe people feel that there's lacking um, resources in certain areas. So this is by or no means like a, a final product once it's done, it can evolve and, and hopefully support the needs of the community as we move forward. So I will touch, shall, shall we look at the uh, questions? I only see that first one, which I'm yeah. hoping that everybody can see. Um, but I'll just read it in case they can't. So I'm happy to see you've included coaches as a critical area. With balancing competitiveness and inclusion, we struggle as a club. Parents and athletes are increasingly critical of less experienced coaches. Thus, we hesitate to operate more teams. We have a backlog of kids who want to play, but coaches are hesitant to take on the growing requirements and parent player expectations. Any advice or tools available on how to support our coaches more as a club parent group? That's an excellent question. And I think I'm, I'm hopeful that when you look in the supportive culture toolkit and some of the suggestions there on the importance of sport as a connector, we actually have to bring back this concept that coaches really are the pillars. Uh, you want to talk a pillar they are the pillars of the sports system. Without coaches, we don't have programs. And a lot of times that is the parent that steps up. However, we've gone and we flipped the script where we've made it so daunting or at times such a negative and very anxiety ridden environment that a lot of, a lot of parents and would be volunteer coaches get really anxious about stepping up because they just don't feel equipped to be able to deal with some of those higher expectations and um, some of those technical requirements, et, et cetera. So in that particular pillar, some of the information in there surrounds this concept of connection and how we can return to a more, I don't know, I guess I want to think there's a purity there where we really are recognizing that we're all in this together. And if we can't find a way to step up and make it more inclusive and make more people feel like they are capable of it and are open to our policy, then, you know, th that's on all of us as a system. So some of those exercises and um, suggestions in there address this idea of building more capacity and, and bringing more parents up. And I don't know, pumping their tires a little bit more, maybe, <laughs> you know, making them feel, I even remember what that felt like myself when my kids were going through this. And I was asking myself, you know, it's been years since I coached, do I really want to take this on? Can I really do this? You know, and I, and I'm in sport for a living and I still felt like I wasn't sure. I still had that imposter syndrome and wondering, can I add this to my plate? Even it was the, one of the most rewarding things that I ever did, but you know, it didn't come without a few bumps. And I think we've got to return to some of these ideas. So it was our attempt in that sport as a connector tool. That's why that pillar is there. So you let me know, Troy, um, if you see anything in there that's helpful. And if I know, I know for a fact, you know how to get a hold of me because you already have. <laughs> so um, feel free to add this to the shopping list of questions that you've sent me by email. So <laughs> I'd love to work on that with you. But thank you for putting that question out there so that more people can benefit from it. I, I so, do think, yeah, and I do want to add that I don't think you're alone in that either, because we've heard that feeling at 
that debrief at the end of last season where, you know, the expectations are increasingly high. And I hear that from my colleagues in other sports as well. Like we're in a, we're in a sort of tough environment here where demand is high, expectations are high, and then finding all the resources that we need in terms of people and facilities and everything is just getting harder and harder. So it's, it's not, and it's not an easy environment, but as Shauna says, hopefully some of these tools at least make spark some thoughts and some ideas of things that you can put in place there's also I think some information in there about recognition and appreciation and just educating people about the roles that people play within your organization and I know that that like I'm involved with a club in another sport and we're guilty of that like I don't think people realize when they send their child along all the different people that play important roles within that organization and it's very it's very easy to be very critical and not really appreciate the amount of hours and hours that go into to running those kind of organizations. Exactly. Yeah. One club that I was working with in another sport, they, they almost, they have in their calendar, they have every, every two months, they do sort of an appreciation, whether it's an event or it's a post or it's some kind of newsletter blast or it's visibility that the club does on behalf of all of those folks that are propping up the kids experience you know, because it's really easy to underappreciate people. Let's face it, right? 100%. We, we got to yeah. bring the humanity back. We got we got to bring it back. And I think it's a global reset. That's what we're trying to do in sport. So, so we have another awesome. question here, Shauna, and it's uh, one um, about referees and how referees often work on their own or with another referee. And that can make it really hard for leaders to recognize and check in on mental health. And whether you have any suggestions, whether the referee group, and I happen to know Steve is, is our uh, head of referee for the province, um, how the referee group could, could, could check in on referee mental health. I honestly think, I don't know if you've taken it or if you've seen some of the resources from Buddy Check, but it's a very simple concept. It's, it's like a, a buddying up system. So you're actually pairing up. It could be a more experienced official with a less experienced official it could be um whatever pairing makes sense in terms of and it can be a virtual network it, it can be something that you do in person it could just be like a weekly check hey how's it going how did those games go last week what was that like where you've got this buddy check that's what it's all about and so they're encouraging it the the genesis of the program was to have a more inclusive and caring locker room in a in the hockey context that's where it initially started but now they're, we've seen it get expanded to coaches doing that for other coaches checking in on one another. And I would say next step then would take, would do the officials, right? And the technical table and the volunteers and the boards and even parent to parent out in the stands, right? You can kind of see when some, when somebody is struggling or someone is grossly overreacting, there is likely something going on there. So we've got to sort of, as a sector, I think we have to absolutely stay athlete centered as where our place we begin but these other very vital roles deserve the same support and caring so take a look at the buddy check resources and see if you couldn't apply some of those to the officiating realm i think it would be very applicable and mm -hmm. let me know Steve, what you think about that mm -hmm. yeah. i think those continuing tools as well are really helpful of just like having and we've heard um, examples of teams doing that as part of their check-in and I think that referees or other volunteer groups or leaders is, is no different really of you know where do where do you sit on this doesn't have to be a complicated check-in it's where oh. are you feeling are you feeling on the green or the red today and what yeah, that or like? thumbs up thumb neutral thumb down you know <laughs> it's yeah. your own personal code and then and then that means you maybe you get together after the match you go and have a chat you go and have a coffee somewhere you go and have a bite to eat and you talk about it that's what buddy checks all about it's about connecting and creating support systems internal and external so we're hoping that this will be these will be some of the spin-offs will be just creating a more inclusive supportive community in volleyball for everyone involved that's my my dream i know it's emma's too so. absolutely I'm not seeing any other questions, so I think we're going to leave it here for now, um, but I do want to take the opportunity to thank everybody for coming and to encourage everyone to go and check out the toolkit. I posted the link as a response to a, a Q&A, but are you, if you just go to our front page, actually, there is a, an announcement there that we've released it and it links straight through. 
Um, so please feel free to go and, and check that out. And as Shauna said, like we're we're really open to feedback and to hearing what you think and hearing if there are pieces that you feel are, are missing or that you think worked really well. It's definitely going to be an evolution process, but we're really excited to get it rolled out and to get as many people as possible looking at it and picking out those pieces that they feel are relevant to their own situation. So I have you got any final words that you want to add for this, Shauna? No, I'm just, I'm just so excited. And I honestly think that volleyball should be incredibly proud that you are the first provincial organization to come up with a mental health strategy in the province of British Columbia. So that's worth celebrating right there is being early adopters and recognizing that there's work to be done, but you're ready to do it. So let's bring Absolutely. It on. And, and by, I'm, by the people that are on this call, I feel like we can do some great things. So thank you everyone for joining us and we wish you a very nice rest of the evening. Thanks everybody.